Would you open your Bibles with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4? We are in our last chapter here. Um, we'll, we will only be covering the first eight verses, though. Uh, there's a lot of stuff uh, here to cover. So please join me there. Let me just give you a quick recap of what we've been going through here with this uh, uh, epistle, this personal letter from the Apostle Paul to the pastor uh, Timothy. Timothy was a pastor in the churches of Ephesus, and um, these are Paul's last words to him. And so as Paul is on his way out, he will be eventually beheaded for his faith. For Jesus, he wants to encourage his young uh, son in the faith to stay firm, to, to be faithful till the end, just like he was being faithful till the end here in his own life, presently speaking, presently writing at that time. So these words are pretty heavy in tone. They are Paul's last words to uh, Timothy here. And he has talked a lot about false teaching, as he does in many of his other letters as well. The, the Bible has a lot to say about false teaching. And I was mentioning uh, to the first service crowd that uh, if you came to, to last Sunday's message and you also came to when, the Wednesday uh, movie night where we looked at the, the, the American Gospel, uh, part one, um, part two, but part the middle part there, the, the first part of part two there, um, then you got a lot out of that because that had a lot to do with what we covered already on Sunday, and that wasn't planned or anything like that. So I, I do see how the Lord sort of is working all the angles here and sort of ministering to, to us on this subject of uh, false teaching and staying in the truth of God, being faithful, and so on. So with that said, let me, let me just open up in a quick word of prayer, and then uh, I'll read the text, verses 1 to 8, and then we'll, we'll tackle it. Lord, we do thank you once again. We want to continue to worship you, Lord, in spirit and truth. And we know that we worship you by praising you, by praying to you, Lord, and also by opening up our Bibles and, and just uh, listening to what you have to say to us. Allow us to receive these things. Lord, we know that your word does not come back void, that it's going to do what you want it to do. What you want it to accomplish, it will accomplish it uh, based upon your power and your authority. And we seek just that this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are here in chapter 4, verse 1. Let's go through the word uh, together here. It says in verse 1, Paul says, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth, and be turned aside to fables. But you, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry." For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved His appearing. So there's quite a few things here that, that we can uh, tackle right off the bat. And the main, uh, the, the main thing that we see here, at least in the first four verses, is this, the subject uh, of preaching. What is biblical preaching? What should that look like in every um, you know, Bible teaching congregation? And I think we see that here. We're going to sort of dig a little bit deeper, go a little bit further into the, the, the words that Paul uses here to, to describe what the, the herald is. Okay? Not, not the name herald, but uh, the, the verb here, the, the, the action of preaching or, or proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. This word herald has its roots also in the, um, the actual herald that actually went ahead of the king, if you will, the forerunner that would go into a town or a city and would proclaim the name of the coming king so the people would get ready for him, kind of like John the Baptist, preparing, being a herald himself also of the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Lamb who would take away the sin of the world. And so that's what I mean by herald. And I think every one of us is a herald in the sense that we're all called to make disciples, to, to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. To a different degree, of course, we have different audiences. Now, if me, for example, at this given time, every Sunday, I'll have a bigger audience, but I think every one of us 
has an audience, even if it's just an audience of one, even if it's your children at home or your spouse or your coworkers or family, we all have an audience, we all have ears that can hear the gospel. And it's so important that we do that. So let's start here with the very first words that Paul uses in verse 1. If you can look there with me, please. He says, I charge you therefore. I want you to pay close attention to this word charge. It is not a light word. He doesn't say, uh, I have a suggestion for you. He doesn't say, I want you to pray about this or think about this, Timothy. This, this word charge can also be rendered warn. It can be rendered warn. And I'll, I'll tell you why. When we find this word charge elsewhere in the, um, in the Bible, in the New Testament, we see it used as a warning. I think the first time that it's used is in Luke chapter 16, where we have the story, some of you might be familiar already, the story of, of uh, the rich man and Lazarus. They are both dead. They are in Abraham's bosom, as some call it. And so <clears throat> the rich man is suffering. He is conscious in this place of torment, and he is able to speak to Abraham. Okay, who is, you know, at a distance from him. And he tells Abraham to, to send Lazarus, okay, the, the, the poor man who died and was being comforted in this place, to tell his five brothers who were still alive. But he uses the word, the same word that Paul uses here, except it's rendered to warn, okay? And there's always this connection between warning and preaching. They are sort of married together. That is, uh, when we preach the gospel, we should not be indifferent Often my temptation when I try to share the gospel with people is, well, I don't want them to say I'm trying to shove anything down their throat. And, and sort of that, that sort of often works against us where we might skit, you know, at least for me, we might skirt around the issues and not address, hey, you know what? Jesus died for sinners. You're a sinner. You need Jesus desperately. Because the other option is, you know, hell, and that's where we're headed. Somebody said that there's a book out there that says, you know, what you need to do to go to hell. You just open up the book and it's just full of blank pages. Why is that? Because you don't need to do anything. Why? Right? We're born sinners. We are headed there. And so the good news must be preached, but there's an urgency behind the message is what, I, what Paul is trying to communicate to, to his young protege here. It is an urgent message. I love what Jude, uh, Jude 1, 22 and 23 has to say about evangelism, preaching. He says, and some have compassion, making a distinction. So there's going to be different people. Some, some hearts are ready to receive. Other hearts, you know, they need to hear the law. They need to hear, hey, you're, you, you're not a good person. You've broken God's laws. And I think that's the emphasis of verse 23. But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. And so there's an urgency behind the preaching of the gospel. We can't be indifferent to this. We cannot be indifferent uh, to sharing our faith. There's always a relation between urgency and the preaching, the testifying of the word. I want you to look also at Acts chapter 8, verse 25. Here we see the same word again, but now it's rendered testify. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel. You can replace it with, so when they had warned and preached the word of the Lord. So when they had, you know, urged and preached the word of the Lord, there is a, there is a weight to the gospel that must be evident in our, in our preaching and speaking. So this word testify also has the, the word picture of, being, uh, of doing something before a crowd or before a jury. And I think the jury that we see here is kind of evident, right? The jury for the pastor or for Timothy is God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not that a pastor has no accountability, because of course there's accountability with leadership, but foremost, because of what James says, he says, let not all be teachers, for they are under greater judgment or condemnation. So the pastor, before anyone else, he, needs to, he is accountable to the Lord. And so he must do this primary thing, preach the word, preach the gospel in season and out of season. What does that mean? In season and out of season. That's an interesting term. Well, what it means is you do it whether they want to hear it or not, whether it's convenient or not, whether there's a coronavirus or no coronavirus, right? Whether the shelves are stocked or the shelves are empty, doesn't matter. It, it, the crowd does not tick, dictate the, the speech of the servant of the Lord. We must preach the gospel. Preach the word, whether it's convenient or absurd. That's our point. Preach the word, whether it's convenient or absurd. Whether it's favorable or not. And I think that's how the, um, that's how the New Living Translation puts it. 
In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, in the NLT, it says to be ready whether the time is favorable or not. Whether the time is favorable or not. Yesterday, I had a, a, a um, I was here to give a, a, a memorial service. And so, it was an opportunity to preach the gospel. And so, maybe, maybe, maybe a lot of people don't necessarily want to hear about Jesus at that time. But the reality is that Jesus is the most important time. Jesus is for every time. Okay? <clears throat> Does that make sense? Jesus is for every time. When we are hurting, when we are having joy... When everything seems at peace or when there is chaos, Jesus is for every time, in season and out of season. That's the second thing we need to take note of here. Preach the word, whether it's convenient or absurd. But why do, why do some people get kind of, you know, antsy, you know, in their pants when, they, when, when the word is preached? Why is that? Why do some people squirm in their seats when the word of God is preached? I'll tell you why. Because it cuts. The word of God is sharp. All right? The word of God, when it is preached biblically, it cuts to the heart. Hebrews 4.12 says it. For the word of God is passive. Is it, is it passive? No, right? It's living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and a dis is a discerner of, of the thoughts and intents or desires of the heart. Or desires of the heart. You see what I'm saying? The Word of God, even for the believer, cuts at the flesh. It's, the, the Word of God is not convenient for my flesh, is what I'm trying to tell you. It's not. And see, I say this because Paul says it here. We can't blame everything on the false teachers, by the way. Because it is the, it is the itch that leads others to go to those who are ready to, to scratch it. Isn't that what he's saying? He says, according to their, <clears throat> notice, own desires, because they have itching ears... They will heap up for themselves teachers. There, they, and they again. Okay? So yes, yes, th there's always going to be a false teaching out there. There's always going to be um, falsehood in light of, of, of the truth. It's been there since day one, right? Since the garden. Who was the f first false, false teacher? The serpent. Satan, right? So it's, he, it, it's always going to be there. And so... There's always going to be those who are going to, to, to leave the presence of, of, of biblical teaching, because that's what's happening here, right? I want you to take notice of that. He's not talking about the world go, looking for a church where they're going to get their ears scratched. He's talking about those who are already under the hearing of biblical teaching. They're going to gravitate towards a message that is easy to digest. Something that says, hey, you are, you are great. You are good. There's nothing wrong with you. Right? You are fine. Just feel good and be good and you'll just be set. Right? Don't forget to leave your offering before you leave. And so there, there, there's that message that, that is given out there, but, but it contradicts what the Bible gives us here. Somebody was, once said, God afflicts the comfortable and comforts the afflicted. God afflicts the comfortable and comforts the afflicted. That is so true. You know, you and I, we are an extension of what we hear. We are an extension of the things that we put in our spiritual bodies, if that makes sense. Like that saying, you are what you eat. Well, that doesn't just apply to material food. That, that also applies to spiritual food. That is, if you are getting solid food, you're going to be a solid Christian for the most part, right? If you're, if you're lacking in the word, then... If the, the word is lacking in the pulpit, then it's going to be lacking in the pews, if, for the most part. That's usually what we get. And so, God's people become an extension of God's word when it's heard. Okay? Our next point. God's people become an extension of God's word when it is heard. And I think that's why, I think that's why Paul urges Timothy to make sure that he does his job right, because if Timothy's doing his job right, that's going to affect the whole congregation. There are more people that that he now is accountable to as well. And doesn't the Bible say something about that also? To submit to your spiritual leaders, for they have to give an account for your souls. So then there's that twofold accountability also. God's people become an extension of God's word when it is heard. So, for us to be biblical people, we need to hear biblical preaching. And now, 
in verse 2, we see the five things or the five ingredients that should be a part of any sermon that we hear today. So if you're taking notes, I want you to pay special attention to verse 2 here where he gives them to us. I'm reading out of the New King James, so it says, Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. We need all these ingredients for a healthy meal of the word. Let's start with convince. A more literal rend rendering is reprove. Reprove. Emphasis on that word prove. One commentator put it like this. The word reprove means to make manifest, to put on trial so as to prove. Why is that? What is this deal about reproving? Why do I need reproof during the Word of God? Well, the Word has the idea of bringing something to light, of, of, of shedding light on our sin. That's what God's Word does. God's Word tends to show me where I need to you know, repent of something. God's Word tends to show me the, the areas that I just need to say, Lord, I, I want to just give it to you now. I don't want to do things that displease you. I want to honor you in my life. It doesn't, it doesn't dismiss grace, by the way. We need grace. But why do you think we need grace after the initial grace to be saved? Because we're going to mess up, right? We're going to mess up. So, so we need that sub subsequent grace, that continuous grace that we find in the Lord. God's people become an extension of God's word when it's heard. But the preaching of the Bible makes us aware of sin in our lives. The preaching of the Bible makes us aware of sin in our lives. That is so true. If it wasn't for the Word of God to preach, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, I mean, the, our conscience convicts us of right and wrong, no doubt. God has given us a conscience to convict us, but the Word of God makes it clear. You see that? So, so we have general revelation, God's creation, but we also have special revelation, God's Word, which gets straight to the point. Yes, your conscience is accurate. You are a sinner, and you need to repent. And so, the preaching of the Bible makes us aware of sin in our lives. That's what reproof means, and that should not be removed from biblical uh, teaching. Number two, another word, similar but not identical, is the word rebuke. There has to be rebuke in the scriptures. And, you know, normally when we say the word rebuke, in our understanding of the word now, um, we, 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 I don't want to get rebuked. Right? I don't want to give rebuke, and I don't want to get rebuked. And, and so, rebuke is something that, that should happen to a degree, I think, in every message. But I, I, I would disagree that the pastor needs to be up here, you know, slamming on the pulpit and just rebuking everybody. That's, that's not right either. Because now you're, you're dismissing the other ingredients, right? There needs to be all of these things. Rebuke is just one of the other five. So what is rebuke? Well, going back to the Bible, letting the Bible interpret itself. The word uh, rebuke is used when, um, when, when Peter rebukes Jesus. Remember that? And then Jesus rebukes Peter. One is wrong, the other one is right. When Jesus tells Peter that he's going to die, Peter pulls Jesus aside and he rebukes him. Not so, Lord, right? And, and Jesus looks at him and then he rebukes him and calls him Satan, right? He says, get behind me, Satan. That's a rebuke. We also see the word rebuke used in the Gospel of Matthew. I think it's chapter 8 uh, in the story where, um, where Jesus is on the boat. He's asleep. The disciples are panicking. He's like, what's happening? We're going to drown. You don't care about us, Jesus. Jesus wakes up and he rebukes the storm. And it obeys. He said to them, why are you fearful, you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Same word. Same word that Paul uses here. When Jesus uses the word rebuke, or, or, or better said, when Jesus rebukes, there's obedience, right? Jesus also rebukes the demons. And I want you to notice this. He doesn't bargain with them. He doesn't, he doesn't say, hey, he didn't tell the legion, hey, would you guys consider or pray about, you know, going into the herd of swine and maybe taking a dip in, into the, the body of water there, whatever it was. Um, no, he doesn't do that. He rebukes. So, so there's this... Um, there's this authority. When you think of rebuke, think about authority. There needs to be an authoritative handling of the Word of God. You know, I'm not a spiritual coach. I'm not out here giving advice for your life. I'm just trying to, you know, expose the Word of God and allow it to, to do what it needs to do. But it's not going to be as if, well, here, here's a list of suggestions, guys. I pray you consider it. No, this is God's Word. It needs to be treated that, that way, just like Jesus treats it, right? Just like he speaks. One more example. Stephen, the first martyr. 
he also rebukes his hearers. And that's actually why, I think, part of the main reason why he's stoned. He didn't do anything wrong, by the way. Because the Bible says right there that he was full of the Holy Spirit. He wasn't full of himself. He was The Holy Spirit gave him boldness to preach accurately, unapologetically. And that's going to happen sometimes. I imagine it this way, because that's a long chapter. Acts chapter 6, if you read Acts chapter 6 and 7 there, it's a long history lesson of... Moses, and he's, he's giving him a great Bible, t Bible study. There's a lot of teaching, right? And I'm pretty sure the Hellenistic Jews were like, amen, brother, right? And then, and then he's like, that's you. You're the prophets. You, you kill the prophets. You, you are hard-hearted. You resist the Holy Spirit. It was like one of those Paul Washer moments, right? I don't know why you're clapping. I'm talking about you type of moments. And that's when they, they're, they're pricked to the heart, and, and, and they rush against him, and they stone him. Yet, there was the element of rebuke, and it was biblical. It was not popular, but it was biblical, and it still is biblical today. We need to have that authority in the handling of the Word of God. Not rehearsed, not sanitized, but just raw and real, right? The Word of God needs to be raw and real. Um, <clears throat> number three, there needs to be exhortation. And this is so important to have as well, because otherwise, if we don't have exhortation, we're just talking at people, okay? Nobody wants to talk, be talked at. They want to be talked to. And often that can be difficult when you're giving a monologue. But I want to I, I encourage you in God's word. I, I want to bring it before you and then give you the choice. Hey, he, here it is. Allow God to, to minister to your heart and obey his word. It's clear. The, the Greek word here for exhortation is parakaleo. All right? And it means to come alongside. I imagine um, coming alongside someone and giving him a hug or her a hug. It's not popular right now either. Right? <laughs> Um, but, but that's the idea, and it's similar to the Greek word for the comforter, or the helper, the Holy Spirit, the, the parakletos. It, it has the idea of coming alongside and helping and assisting and encouraging. God's word should do that as well. God's word should give us comfort. So here's our point. It's not just passion, but compassion, right? Preaching has compassion, not just passion. Because the reason we do it is because we love them, because we want them to hear and believe and to grow. Now, granted, there is, a, there, is a, there is a context here where, you know, Timothy is not just a, a preacher and he, he is evangelizing as well, and we'll touch on that, but, but these things need to happen. It's not just a fiery passion, but also compassion. What else do we see here? There needs to be patience or long Suffering, long suffering. Why do I? Why would you need long suffering when, when you're sharing the word, when you're teaching and preaching the word of God? Well, because one message is not going to cut it. One Bible study is not going to do it, right? And if, if you've discipled anybody, if you've, um, you know, just think about your own kids. Do, do they? I mean, do you have to tell them one? Do, do any? Does anybody have any kids that you've only told them once and they've all, you've never had to remind them, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't, unless you're, you're Jesus, you know, you, it's, uh, you, you have to keep telling them. So it's a matter of reminder, so you need patience. And so I know, man, imagine if, if God showed me all the patience that he's given me already. So much patience. And that's, we have to have patience with other people in our, in, in our speaking, in our preaching, and in our teaching. It's so, so important because people, sometimes people grow at different rates. If you think about uh, the disciples of Jesus Christ, the 12 disciples, right? They were all different people. And I wish I knew more about the other ones that are not talked about so much. Maybe when we meet them in heaven, we'll know more about them. But just with the ones we do know, you know, that we do know that the Bible does dedicate time to, usually when they mess up, we know that they were not perfect people, right? There was an unbeliever in the group, uh, Judas, who was stealing from the money box. You had uh, the Sons of Thunder who were like, they had a lot of... Uh, what a rebuke, right? Call, call thunder that down on them and so on. And then you have Peter, right? Peter, who if he wasn't giving Jesus more work by cutting some dude's ear off or, or uh, denying Jesus or, you know, rebuking Jesus, which is what we just covered, you know, we see him do these things, but then we don't, I don't see Jesus saying, oh, well, that's strike three, Peter, right? He doesn't do that. I'm probably, I, I probably would do it. If I'm honest with you, I would do it. I'd be like, yeah, you, you should probably do some more sitting at the feet of Jesus before you continue to serve if you've got these characteristics. But not Jesus. Why? 
because he is all long suffering, because he is long suffering, because he is loving. And so in Galatians chapter 5, we see the fruit singular of the Spirit. And that is the same word that is used here long suffering. So preaching has to have love behind it. There needs to be a love always and a patience for those that we that we share Jesus with. I think that that should be the 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 backbone, the, the motivator. Preaching must have compassion, not just passion. And lastly here, but not least, is teaching. Preaching and teaching. You know, some denominations make a, uh, a big distinction between these two. They will have uh, two types of services on Sundays. <clears throat> Sometimes they call them Sunday schools. Well, they'll have a preaching, a teaching and a preaching. They'll have a service just for teaching and a service just for preaching. And, you know, if you're familiar with Calvary Chapels, we, we try not to make too much of this thing. We try to have both, right? you got to have both if there's going to be growth, in my opinion. You really do. There's, there's got to be an, an, an exegesis of the word. The word needs to come alive, and then you just need to preach it. The gospel needs to be there. It needs to be proclaimed, and teaching is a part of it. And I think it's biblical because that's what Paul is saying here. Make sure you preach the word. There's exhortation, all these things, rebuke, and, and teaching. I like how one pastor put it. He said, true preaching is the explanation and application of Bible doctrine. The explanation and the application of Bible doctrine. So we need to have these two things if there's going to be growth. That's our, our point here. There must be both if there's going to be growth. Now, Timothy was a pastor, so the main people that he was preaching and teaching were those in the congregation. But sometimes in the congregation, there's going to be visitors who don't know Jesus. So definitely, there, there always needs to be that element of evangelism, that element of the gospel being preached. But... I don't think the Sunday servant service should be a, a, a harvest crusade either, okay? The, Sunday, the priority of the Sunday service is for the ecclesia, for the church, for, as uh, Ephesians 4.11, I believe, says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So the saints can preach the gospel, right? Because the church is not just a Sunday service. The church is the people of God, and the people of God go and do uh, the work of God and part of that work is the preaching of the gospel so 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 we need teaching there must be both if there's going to be to be growth so so important now I want you to look at the next section here in, in verse 5 he tells them a few more things that are in regards to perseverance and adversity perseverance and adversity and I know that that this theme has sort of crossed over from 1st Timothy to 2nd Timothy there's a lot of you know if you want to if you want to read about adversity just look at the life of Paul if you want to not throw the towel look at the life of Paul and so he says this but you be watchful in all things or, or sober-minded be watchful keep your eyes open this is how David Gusick put put it Every good shepherd keeps his eyes open. Every good shepherd keeps his eyes open. So the shepherd must be focused on, on the primary role that God has given him, which is to communicate the word of God accurately, right? To cut straight, as we read uh, last uh, a few weeks ago, right? To rightly divide the word of God. That is not the only job of the pastor, but that is one of the main jobs of the pastor, to make sure that he's preaching the word of God accurately, feeding the flock but he needs to be watchful. His eyes must be open. He says, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And here we see again that the pastor is not just a teacher, but also a preacher. I think, and some commentators believe that, Timothy might have, might have had some struggles with evangelism. He probably had some struggles with anxiety, too. Maybe that's why he tells Timothy earlier on, hey, uh, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, but a power of love and a sound mind. I mean, he doesn't just tell him these things for no reason. They, they apply to him specifically as well. And so we see here that Timothy, this pastor, was to do the work of an evangelist. Evangelism takes work. We, we have to share our faith with people. We have to love on people, build a bridge with people. Somebody was mentioning about, you know, during this time how, you know, a lot of shelves are empty. And, and you know, if you have, if you have extra uh, amount of things, you know, maybe, maybe reserve those things and look for those opportunities to, you know, use that as a bridge to bless somebody else, to open up a conversation. And I think during these times, you know, 
God uses the church during times of difficulty because that's usually when people are more open to the gospel when they are in panic when there is uncertainty people tend to look to God's uh, sovereignty and and so I encourage you to do that to practically love on others during this time so there is an there is a, the work of an evangelist to fulfill the ministry necessary but there is also the endurance of affliction so three things with the letter W to watch to withstand and to work the pastor must watch must, must withstand and also work but the secondary application is this for for all of us really we have to watch we have to be careful that we're not deceived by false teaching pulled pulled aside by things that are not true and we also have to endure right we have to be faithful no matter what we're going through jesus is still alive he is still king doesn't matter we need to keep our eyes focused on the lord and we need to work at sharing him with others i love that he says here you know endure afflictions that 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 is a good reminder right that you know what it's not an easy job to serve the lord it's not an easy job to 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 be a pastor and i'm not just saying that because i because of that's because i'm a pastor i remember when um when I, when I started here uh, as a senior pastor, I already had a love for the Word. I love to teach the Bible, you know? And I was like, well, great. You know, I get to do what, what I love to do. But that wasn't it. It wasn't just that. The Lord showed. The Lord stretched me, and He's been stretching me. And it's not, no, you got to love the people. You, you can't just, you're not just here to give a Bible study and check out, right? It's, it's, it's an investment. You've got to grow with people. There's a community. It's not just the Apostles' Doctrine. It's the breaking of bread. It's prayer, right? Communion, all these things that the early church did. That's, that's what it's about. And so there is an endurance that, needs, that, that, is, that is applied here. Why do we need endurance? Because there's going to be stress. There's going to be afflictions. The world is going to attack. There's going to be problems in the church and outside of the church. You know why Paul was in jail, in prison? It was because he was preaching the word of God. He was preaching in season and out of season when it wasn't convenient. And so he found himself there, but he was still in God's will. So there's going to be an endurance of things. And I, I, and I want to emphasize this because the ministry is always going to have some, some trouble. And so we need to make sure that we understand that. So we can count the cost and keep going faithfully and not quit just because it got hard or someone said something I didn't like and so on. It's so important. Verse 6 says, For I am already, notice this, I'm already, I am already to take a vacation, to, right, to get a cheap air flight. No, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. He wasn't on a cruise ship. He was on a battleship. He's going to die, he says. And the time of my departure is at hand. So, two things to take note of here. The word departure was used of un unhooking a, a ship, removing the, the, the rope, unroping a ship, and allowing it to set sail into the, into the sea. It's a departure. And it's a picture of going home to be with the Lord. That's what he's saying. Look, I'm on my way out. I'm going to go be with Jesus, right? But then he gives us another picture that takes us back to Numbers 15, the Old Testament. A sacrificial word picture here where he talks about that he is being poured out. Did you see that? I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. Now, the drink offering was the offering that was made at the very end of the sacrifices there. It was either poured on the sacrifice or sometimes poured on the ground. That's what Paul is saying here. My life is that wine, that drink offering, and it's about to expire. There's just a little bit left there. I'm on my way out. See, your life and my life is an offering. Your life and my life is, is, is a form of worship to the Lord. What we do with our life. That's what Romans 12, 2 is about, I think. Romans 12, 2. We are a living sacrifice for the Lord. So I want you to notice this. Paul does not stop just because it's difficult. Okay, you should not stop just because it's difficult. Don't stop till you drop. I got that from, from a song somewhere. I forget who, who did it, but, but it's not identical, but yes, I borrowed it. We don't stop till we drop. And, and that is true because Paul's not stopping. He's not quitting. He's not calling Caesar Lord. He's still calling Jesus Lord. And that is a great testimony, a, a great testimony for us today. We, we don't stop till we drop. We got to pour ourselves out till we run out of ourselves for Jesus Christ. And then, 
There's going to be that crown of righteousness, right? There's going to be that reward that we get from the Lord. It's something that often is not emphasized in the Bible. Verse 7 and on. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I want that to be said of me whenever it is my time uh, to go, if the Lord tarries. For people to be able to say that, you know, I didn't give up, that I, that, that I kept going till, till my last breath. And I hope that that is your desire as well, to just keep going, to just keep serving the Lord and not give up. To be able to say that you finished the race and that you kept your faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. The day that the Lord gives his rewards to his people. Not to me only, notice that. Not just to, to you, Timothy, the pastor, or me, the, the apostle, Paul. But to who? To all who have loved his appearing. Notice his eyes were on Jesus. That's where our eyes need to be at. If you, if you want to if you wanna get ahead, you got to look ahead, right? you got to look to Jesus. Just like he says in Philippians 2, 3, is it? That, that upward call of God. I'm, I'm, I'm going forward. I don't know about you guys. I'm not going to look backward. I'm going to keep going forward. And that's how Paul sort of ends this section here. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Look for his return. Look for his coming. Don't stop till you drop. Lord, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for what it does to us and in us and through us. And we ask that we would be filled with your Holy Spirit. That you would enable us to do these things. Because apart from you, Lord, your word says we can do nothing. Forbid us, Lord, from trying to do anything apart from you. We want to do things right. We want to do things in the Spirit. So I ask that you would enable us, that you would fill us with your Spirit, that our hearts would be contrite and right before you. So I pray if, if somebody's heart here this morning is not right before you, Lord, if you've already pricked their heart through your word, not, th not through any pressure of my own words, but through your word, Lord. I pray that that person would be drawn to you, as your word says, that the Father draws, draws to the Son. So we thank you, Lord, for your people, and we thank you, Lord, for those who are going to believe in you. And if that's you this morning, God's word makes it clear that if you believe with your heart the Lord Jesus, and confess, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the authority of God's word. So I pray you believe that today and you follow Jesus. And don't give up. In Jesus' name, amen.